Think Forward. Think Research Channel. From the National Science Foundation, where discoveries begin, this is Frontier. Discussions of today's most exciting research subjects by distinguished scientists and engineers working at the frontiers of knowledge. I'd like to welcome you all to the celebration of the International Polar Year 2007-2008 hosted by the National Academy of Sciences and the National Science Foundation. My name is Jim White. I'm a professor at the University of Colorado. And I, you folks calm down faster than a room full of freshmen, so I'm very impressed. We have a very exciting and a hopefully very informative program for you this afternoon. We will have a series of speakers. Uh, if there are pressing questions after an individual talk, we invite you to ask that pressing question. But otherwise, we've scheduled some time at the end of the talks to have question and answer, and you'll find microphones down in front of the auditorium. So please come down and use those microphones. Now, without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce Ralph Cicerone, President of the National Academy of Sciences. Prior to his election as President of the National Academy, he was on the faculty at the University of California, Irvine, where he served as founding chair of the Department of Earth System Science Dean of the School of Physical Sciences and Chancellor. He is an atmospheric scientist whose research in atmospheric chemistry and climate change has involved him in shaping science and environmental policy at the highest levels, both nationally and internationally. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ralph Cicero. Thank you, Jim. We've been looking forward to this day for some months. It's historic. And I think we do not take enough time to look back in time. In this case, though, we're also looking forward. Welcome to the National Academy of Sciences and this celebration of the International Polar Year. I want to thank the National Science Foundation, several of whose leaders are here today, and especially Dr. Arden Bement, the director, for planning and co-hosting this event with us and for serving as the lead government agency from the US government for the International Polar Year. Bringing together about 12 federal agencies is difficult in itself, and they've succeeded. Uh, with us here today are people from all around the world who are taking part in the 32nd Antarctic Treaty meeting, including His Highness Prince Albert II of Monaco. We're very pleased to welcome me here today. Uh, I must say that four weeks ago, I was at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography in La Jolla for a memorial of the 100th birthday of Roger Revelle, who, of course, died in 1991. But this year was the awarding of the first Roger Revelle Prize with the participation of Roger's family and the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, University of California, San Diego. And this year's winner was former Vice President Al Gore. So uh, the ceremony was wonderful. The prize was awarded. Roger Revelle's life was commemorated. And at the very end, there was an announcement that the second award will be given this coming October to Prince Albert of Monaco. And we were, congratulations. <laughs> And many of you who have come from such a long distance, uh, we also thank you for being here, and more importantly, for all the work that you're doing every day and in the next two weeks to ensure the success of the treaty. Uh, the National Academy of Sciences has a, a long history of facilitating international collaboration in science. Uh, we helped to plan the International Geophysical Year in 1957 and 58, and that event itself brought many original uh, occurrences such as the launch of the world's first Earth orbiting satellites by several countries. Uh, 
We then played a role in the creation of the Antarctic Treaty 50 years ago. As you know, in 1959, the negotiations occurred here in this building, in the historic part of our building, in the boardroom, where even during the Cold War, science academies worldwide were collaborating as they do today. So the negotiations were not so much government to government at the beginning, but they were, they were here, and then later the governments agreed. We also helped to plan the International Polar Year 2007-2008, the current year, by hosting planning discussions and producing a report in the year 2004, which served as a roadmap for the U.S. and some international efforts. And all of these efforts have been difficult and challenging to implement, and in this country, the National Science Foundation, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the U.S. Geological Survey, the Department of Energy, and the Smithsonian and many, many colleagues from around the world representing themselves and other countries have contributed so much. Perhaps 50,000 people, including scientists, technicians, students, ship crews, and many others have participated in nearly 200 International Polar Year projects. The IPY is similar to past IPYs and to the International Geophysical Years in some ways. It has certainly been uh, focus of attention. It's been able to focus attention on the polar regions of Earth and to make new discoveries. And is, it has allowed the use of new technology in many new ways, involving many different agencies and governments. For example, the Lima project, the Landsat Image Mosaic of Antarctica, involving the British Antarctic Survey, our NASA, NSF, and USGS has produced the first true color high resolution satellite view of the Antarctic continent with great fidelity. But it's also clear that the IPY, this IPY, differs from past such efforts. For example, this IPY goes beyond the geosciences to include an even more diverse range of science, including some social sciences. This IPY also gives specific attention to the linkages between polar regions and the rest of the world, far more so. This IPY is happening in a time of instant communications, which has certainly helped us to handle large collections and analysis of data. And this IPY has included unprecedented educational and outreach activities, which is engaging many, many young people around the world. And this IPY has also had a, a major leadership component from women, which is uh, very encouraging, and that in turn is engaging more young women in the field. Uh, for example, three U.S. scientists who have had very important roles in IPY programs are Mary Albert, who led the Norwegian U.S. Scientific Traverse of East Antarctica to study climate variability and glaciology, uh, Robin Bell, who led a seven-nation project called GAMBIT, an aerogeophysical study of the Gambertsev subglacial mountains to better define the crustal architecture and to locate the oldest ice in East Antarctica, and Terry Wilson, who led a project called Polnet to set up a network of global positioning system and seismic stations in West Antarctica to study how ice sheet masses uh, change over time. Finally, there's another difference which as yet is not so clear, and that is that if we were to anticipate what Antarctica would be like 50 years from now, we're beginning to see that major changes may be in store. First of all, mechanistically, we know of a number of feedbacks on Earth's climate, everything from as simple as the reflectivity of ice surfaces contrasting with the reflectivity of meltwater ponds and surrounding ocean, uh, is, is a potentially positive feedback, a, a, a growing feedback on the climate system. We know of the uh, precipitation feedback where warmer ocean waters elsewhere in the world will cause more precipitation. And if that occurs over Antarctica, there could be accumulation on parts of Antarctica, creating a, a real challenge to sort out the mass balance. And then, of course, we know to the uh, overall effects on sea level of the loss of continental ice and the dynamical processes at the edges, which will help to control how fast that occurs. 
I would venture to say that any of us here 50 years from now, some of you, will be commenting on what happened in this decade. So it's a very dramatic time, and the science is exciting. The potential societal relevance is very important. The importance of having nations to negotiate and agree on something for the benefit of all humankind is very inspiring. Uh, once again, welcome, and I thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Dr. Cicerone. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Arden Bement, the director of the National Science Foundation. Dr. Bement oversees a robust international research program in the polar regions, as well as several international partnerships to build sophisticated research and experimental facilities. Prior to his confirmation as NSF director in November of 2004, he served as the director of the National Institute of Standards and Technology at the Department of Commerce. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Arden Bement. Well, good afternoon. It's a distinct honor for me to welcome you on behalf of the National Science Foundation. And I'd like to begin also by noting a piece of polar history that occurred exactly 100 years ago. On that day in 1909, Matthew Henson was among the first to reach the North Pole. Henson, an African-American, was a member of Admiral Perry's expedition. It seems altogether fitting and proper that a meeting that in part commemorates the 50th anniversary of the uh, signing of the Antarctic Treaty Consultative should begin in Baltimore this week because Henson was a native of Maryland. He would have been delighted and astonished at the progress of science and exploration in the past century. Winston Churchill once famously said in a very different context, this is not the end, it is not even the beginning of the end, but it is the end of the beginning. I hope that you will leave this room today as expectant as I am that the same can be said of the International Polar Year. The average person might have been a bit confused to hear about a polar year that actually lasted two years. But as we know, the cold and dark of the polar regions severely limit the amount of useful science that could be carried out in any one research season at either end of the globe. Likewise, non-scientists may not understand that while we are celebrating the many important accomplishments that did occur between March 2007 and today, as scientists, we're always looking at the horizon. Researchers realize that while the IPY fieldwork that spanned two full years is winding up, many exciting IPY science findings may be published only after months years or even decades spent analyzing and interpreting the, the data. In a few moments, we'll be hearing from accomplished investigators how IPY research has advanced frontiers and fields that range from climate science to understanding the mechanics of the world's great ice sheets to the sociological ramifications of unprecedented changes occurring in the Arctic. I would just like to emphasize some overarching themes that I believe will be the lasting legacy of IPY. To begin, as I've already noted, some IPY results may not even reach fruition for years. It may be the next generation of scientists, or even the one after that, that first realizes the full significance of results obtained by scientists during IPY. For example, Ozone monitoring instruments deployed during the International Geophysical Year of 1957 to 58 revealed their true worth only 15 to 20 years later when satellite observations showed an anomaly in their measurements. The IGY instruments provided the benchmark data that put the satellite measurements in true perspective and showed that something important had changed. Here in the United States, NSF, NASA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the Department of Energy, the U.S. Geological Survey, and other agencies have led the development of the U.S. portion of the Arctic Observing Network. Our network component is being linked 
to other nations observing networks, such as Damocles and Arctic Net and other building blocks to form a circum-Arctic observing system. The ultimate goal is to develop a sustaining Arctic observing network called SEON that will ac accommodate near real-time data delivery and include a repository for data storage, a portal for discovery, and tools to manipulate the data. This network and its successors will provide the information needed to improve our ability to predict the effects of climate change. It is hoped that this will eventually allow not only for observations on timescales from seasons to centuries, but perhaps even on spatial scales from counties to continents. A complement to our ability for observing atmospheric and ocean systems is a multinational observing network that is crucial to understanding the mass balance of the vast ice sheets in both the northern and southern hemispheres. Linking GPS observations of bedrock elevation changes in both Greenland and Antarctica to the satellite gravity measurements provides an added dimension in our polar observing networks. It will tell us how the mass of the large ice sheets is changing. These observing systems are of paramount importance given the nature and speed of the changes taking place in the polar regions in recent years and the worldwide influence these regions have on climate. There is, however, another kind of uh, overarching legacy that may be the most important one of all. Many young people have become intensely excited and curious about the polar regions through innovative programs in classrooms, science museums, and on the internet during IPY. These programs allowed them to visit virtually scientists in the field. This may be the impetus for them to become scientists in their own right in the years to come. In addition, we should all recognize that the I in IPY signifies that researchers from the U.S. and more than 60 other nations built a knowledge base that will elucidate our actions deep into the next century. As one U.S. researcher stressed, these results could not have been achieved by any one nation acting alone. But the other value emerging from our common focus on the I is a legacy of lasting collaborations among research groups around the globe that have self-formed during IPY with the active assistance of governments. I can't resist mentioning that these collaborations have already brought about a number of key discoveries that you will hear about from our speakers in just a few minutes. I hope I have convinced you that this may well be only the end of the beginning of IPY. But what a beginning it is. We at the National Science Foundation are proud to have been part of it together with our colleagues from NASA, NOAA, USGS, DOE, the Smithsonian Institution, and several other sister federal agencies. And I wish you all good luck during the discussions over the next two weeks. Thank you very much. My job this afternoon is to uh, introduce the first speaker in this session, who is a good colleague of mine, Dr. Tim Colleen. Tim came to the National Science Foundation, where he is the head of the uh, Directorate for the Geosciences from the National Center for Atmospheric Research. Uh, Tim was there from, uh, for, I think, eight years, from 2000 to 2008 or something like that, maybe. Uh, after a very distinguished career as a professor of uh, space and atmospheric sciences at the University of Michigan, uh, Tim also uh, has a long history of outstanding service to the science community. Uh, for example, he was elected president of the American Geophysical Union, which, which I think is one of the largest scientific societies in the United States. It must have, its members have meetings with 12 and 13,000 participants, and Tim somehow heads a staff, or did head a staff, that managed to organize such things. Uh, I'd like you to ask, I'd like you to help me welcome Tim, who will talk to us about a systems view of climate change to provide a framework for the subsequent discussions this afternoon. Tim. Thank you very much, Carl, and uh, thanks to everybody for um, 
allowing me to represent the rest of the geosciences community, not specifically the polar community, and to congratulate the IPY community and everybody involved in this uh, magnificent program that has really been a paradigm shift and that has pioneered the systems approach to understanding the planet and the human relationship with the planet. And that's no small feat. And as Dr. Bement said, it's just the beginning of, of the story. So I'd like to give you uh, a little bit of the climate modeling perspective of where we are today, where we've come from, and where we need to go in terms of understanding the Earth as a system, with uh, the polar regions really embedded within that system as, as a microcosm of that. It's a grand challenge to understand our planet, and modeling climate change dates back quite a way. Um, Arrhenius quantified in 1896 the changes in surface temperature, approximately five degrees Celsius, to be expected from a doubling of CO2 very close to actually our modern understanding. He based this on, on a concept of the glass bowl effect introduced in 1824 by Joseph Fourier. So we stand on the shoulders of giants, and the first climate models were developed by many uh, in, uh, in the last latter part of the last century, and I just want to single out Manabi, Arakawa, uh, uh, Arakawa and uh, my own colleague Warren Washington, who was a former chair of the National Science Board in his, in his youth there. The concept of Earth systems science, the systems perspective, which is really exemplified in the IPY, goes back perhaps to the 70s, but this was a famous step along the way. This was the so-called Bretherton diagram. It was the first time, really, that uh, people imagined the interconnected components of the Earth as a system. Notice how atmospheric physics <coughs> occupied the biggest box. If you were to do this today, human humankind would occupy the biggest box in the middle, and economic systems and policy issues would probably occupy the biggest box. At this time, human activities was kind of out uh, on the right-hand side. But for all of that, this was the first attempt to integrate the system and, and to understand that the, the, the way the component parts interacted really was going to lead to the scientific understanding. So as climate models have progressed since then, they started out in the mid-1970s with uh, just rainfall and uh, CO2 emissions. By the mid-1980s, uh, ice was prescribed. It was a boundary condition. It wasn't dynamic. Uh, clouds existed, but there were lots of problems with them. Uh, about five years later, for the first assessment report of the IPCC, the ocean was a swamp ocean, and then by the uh, uh, mid-90s, you had sulfates and volcanic activity. You can see that the system concept was beginning to grow in computers. And now, of course, we have, in the most recent Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, interactive vegetation, we have chemistry, we have the role of uh, sulfates, uh, clouds, and we have ice in all, of its, uh, in all of its forms. But there's much more to do to increase the sophistication of that. So the timeline of climate modeling development goes back to the 60s, and you can see a little snapshot of how hard it's been and how much work has been done to really understand the Earth as a system. In the mid-60s, again, it was just the atmosphere and the ocean. By the mid-90s, the carbon cycle was incorporated. For the present day, we have biogeochemical cycles such as carbon, nitrogen. Again, we have interactive vegetation. We have dust, uh, carbon cycles, sea ice is in there. But you notice that the, what's needed next is ice sheet dynamics. In the inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, one of the uh, major recommendations was to really improve our understanding of polar processes and, and particular ice sheets. And as this work has proceeded, we've had to come uh, across party lines and do much more interdisciplinary work. The individual PIs who pioneered the work in the mid-60s have been replaced to some extent by large teams, by distributed interdisciplinary interagency teams, by large international projects with 20 climate models, uh, sophisticated climate models, uh, looking at what might happen uh, using the same socioeconomic scenarios. This has become big science. And the resolution of the climate models has improved over time. And here's just a, a, a schematic to show you about where we are today. The, the current state-of-the-art climate models have resolutions of the order of 100 kilometers or so. And you can resolve the Pyrenees and you can resolve the Rockies, but you can't resolve things like the Chesapeake Bay or, uh, or certain um, uh, watershed systems. As resolution from, uh, from the demands and achievements in information technology have increased by a factor of five, one asks the question, are the models getting better? 
as you increase the sophistication of the, uh, of the characterization of the intersecting components and, and so forth. And the answer to that is yes, the models are in fact getting better. This is a timeline of improvements in skill, if you like, in the predictions from the climate models of wind systems in the atmosphere. The wind systems control the frontal passages, et cetera. And so you're looking at a reduction in the errors as the climate models have progressed, as they've added component uh, uh, elements, uh, the accuracies have, in have increased. In fact, you could say that over the last 15 years or so, as the resolution of the clim community climate system models have increased by about a factor of six, the fidelity of the simulated winds have improved by a factor of 20. So we're making progress. We're making progress with these systems. And now our current understanding tells us a lot about the future. We have a crystal ball. It's being built over these decades. We can use it to look forward. It's an imperfect crystal ball. It's got striations. It's murky. But we can see with these models what, uh, what the future looks like. And this is a picture from the uh, IPCC of the current models, and it shows the global warming uh, 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 probability distribution functions for different models and for different socioeconomic um, uh, scenarios. I just want to point out two things. The middle column is a prediction of the temperature structure on the planet circa 2030, during many of our professional lives. And you can see that these pictures don't differ very much in their color. And that's because we are already committed to that class of warming. There's already built into the Earth system a commitment to that warming. However, at the end of the century, and these are incidentally different socioeconomic pathways, with A2 being the most fossil fuel intensive. But by the end of the century, you can notice with your eye that there's a different distribution of red. And that is because it does matter how much uh, carbon is in the atmosphere over the centennial uh, time frames. So for me, this central column is adaptation. We're going to have to adapt to changing circumstances in smart ways based on good science, based on integrated system science, with understanding of how the polar processes work and the rest of the system works. And then we also have to concern ourselves with mitigating, uh, mitigation. So adaptation and mitigation are words that are sometimes posed in a false dichotomy. We need both, the middle column uh, tells us about adaptation, and the, and the column on the right tells us about mitigation. The highest resolution current climate system models look like this. This is out of a computer now, and this is at a resolution of about 0.35 degrees. These are spectral models, so the, uh, so the grid points are not equispaced in, uh, in horizontal and, and distance. But you can kind of see the, uh, the sort of resolution that's available now. Frontal passages are clearly evident there. You can see uh, tropical cyclones form and move in, in, in reasonable ways. And the bottom picture is the highest resolution heroic run to date on a Japanese supercomputer where the cell size was 3.5 kilometers. That is the state of the art. We can model the globe with these Earth system models at about 3.5 kilometers if you ignore the presence of ice or trees or land. In fact, this model here is a aqua planet. It's just an ocean planet. So that's where we are today. In the next few years, we will fill this picture in with, uh, with all of the detailed structure that, uh, that uh, um, looks and resembles reality of the Earth system. So what are the leading scientific challenges going forward from this current state of the art? Well, many of them are related to um, IPY interests. Polar feedbacks are clearly uh, very important. Regional climate change will be uh, um, the name of the game. Uh, we're moving from a global perspective to a regional perspective. The ice sheet changes and the consequent rising sea levels, the role of water in an in a intensified hydrological cycle, uh, and what that does for food, security, for example, acidification in the ocean, the role of methane gas, which is not yet fully included in the current state-of-the-art models, extreme events, um, uh, such as uh, severe weather um, events, biodiversity and ecosystem function, human health, smart adaptation and smart mitigation, and potentially disruptive climate change, and then the whole role of uncertainty. How does one influence societal decision-making when one is dealing with intrinsic uncertainty and limits of predictability? This is a scientific future that is unlike anything science has really uh, had to deal with in the past, and all the ones in red have their polar issues associated with them. So the polar regions, are in tr central to our understanding of the Earth as a system and all of these leading-edge scientific uh, issues, scientific challenges, which we'll be working on in the, in the future. 
um, pertain to the polar regions. They're all IPY relevant. And so we have a future now where we could imagine the next generation of models having the spatial, the regional fidelity, and the full sophistication of the Earth system processes to get to predictive capabilities that can help people, that can help human well-being. In, in its full sense. For example, uh, and, and at the bottom here, what I'm showing uh, are factors of three, 10 to the three increments in computational ability. Going from megaflops to gigaflops to teraflops, and now we are now building the first petascale computing systems that will be able to incorporate the climate and the weather models, bring in hydrological cycles, bring in the terrestrial biosphere with the ecosystem variability and dynamics, and also perhaps uh, do solid earth modeling where one could imagine prediction of, na of, uh, of natural hazards. Building what will be a human artifact that will be of great utility into the foreseeable future, a predictive system based on sound science, based on quantitative understanding of how the system interacts in all of its richness, in computational settings from which one can des derive decision tools that can support societal function. If this is not an exciting future for the youth uh, who are interested in science and technology, uh, I don't know what is. And the Arctic, of course, and the Antarctic are, as I said, examples of this richness in our systems thinking. So I'm going to leave you with a bottom line message that the IPY's legacy includes the systems thinking, not just understanding the mechanistic details, but trying to go from end to end to end to understand the system in its full complexity. And as you all know, probably much better than I, the Arctic has all of these interacting systems in a, in a microcosm, the heating, the cooling, the freshwater runoff, uh, the permafrost issues, the e ecosystems, the uh, large mammals, the, uh, uh, the radiative balance, uh, the feedback loops, the nonlinearities, the potential for disruptive events. And so what does IPY contributed to understanding this complex system. It's contributed, amongst other things, a willingness to work across international boundaries that I think is extraordinary. And here's just an example of that in the NABOS uh, project, the international collaboration and synthesis, looking at the Arctic Ocean, looking at a warm water intrusion with multiple uh, deployed facilities, all coordinated internationally in a, and with a common data reference system. Um, this is the kind of science we're going to have to do uh, increasingly, not just in the Arctic and the Antarctic, but throughout the, throughout the world. These new capabilities are going to drive our compu computing systems hard. They're going to lead to complex data streams at multiple scales. We're going to have to deal with heterogeneity across, uh, across multiple scales. We're going to have to look at uh, short-lived processes, very long-lived processes. Um, we're going to have to look at process field studies. There'll be high-resolution Earth system simulations, and we're going to have to incorporate that right-hand box in the Bretherton diagram, which relates to human beings and how they interact and how they make decisions under, under conditions of uncertainty and what the policy implications and scenario implications are. And so this is all going to be carried forward. We're proud within the NSF that we're going to contribute to the future, too, with a new facility, which I just wanted to highlight briefly, the Alaska Region Research Vessel, which was approved for construction by the National Science Board just last week. This will be a vessel that will be the first green ship. It'll be uh, uh, completely accessible to disabled people, and it will allow us to really study in detail the, disappear the uh, re reducing ice sheet in the Arctic regions, looking at all of the marginal processes. Uh, ocean productivity, the world's larger fisheries are there, the ice reduction and its impacts, paleoclimate and cultural anthropology, uh, geologic and seismic events, and an emphasis on science education and outreach, which has been another extraordinary contribution of the IPY. So where has the IPY brought us, and where is it leaving us? These legacies are really important, and they're needed. In fact, it's almost ironic to think of how much society needs these predictive tools and how they're now, now because of the changes that are rapidly unfolding, and how we're just achieving those tools and capabilities now. We could have understood the Earth system 100 years ago, or we could have waited for another 100 years to understand it, but we're understanding it now. This crystal ball is coming into focus, and it's coming into focus just when we need it as, 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 as uh, human, human beings. The legacies of the IPY, I would say, 
international collaboration. We need to build up from that. That needs to be expanded, uh, developed further. It needs to uh, devolve from Arctic and high latitude regions to other regions of the planet. Uh, Africa, for example, is another area where we, we, we desperately need uh, uh, improved understanding. The observational data uh, legacy will be mined for decades to come. The experimental infrastructure that exists will be extremely important. And the commitment to education and outreach and humor in the education and outreach and the uh, appealing nature of the content, the visible nature of the content, and how open the community has been to bring in uh, teachers and learners at all type. But I would submit that perhaps the biggest legacy will be this commitment to system science, to actually taking on the tough problem, the tough non-specialist problem of understanding how the system functions as an integrated whole with all of its non-linearities and surprises. So as IPY, we celebrate IPY, we go towards an integrated earth systems perspective where there will be tools such as this. We're looking here at the uh, current era to 2090, the predictions of temperature. Here are the permafrost regions uh, in the Arctic regions as modeled. There are the regions of permafrost near surface permafrost that are going to go away, and the red lines represent the roads built on those permafrost regions that are going to go away. And we can take these models, and we can start to build from them capabilities that will be useful to decision makers. And here's another snapshot. This is a GIS tool where we're now homing in on the uh, American content, continent, and here is a very high resolution regional scale model coupled with a weather model, high-end high weather model at highest uh, resolution where you can actually resolve individual cloud tops. So we can combine weather and climate, and we can look at land surfaces, and ultimately we will understand this planet um, in sufficient detail to make intelligent decisions going forward. So I'd like to make some acknowledgments of my colleagues who've helped me with this presentation and leave you with, again, a sense that the IPY has made many contributions for the geoscientists that I represent. Biggest contribution, most seminal contribution, has possibly been to look at the system as a whole, even when that crosses party lines and you have to work in an interdisciplinary space, including reaching out to the social sciences. So thank you very much. The uh, next speaker is David Holland, who's a professor of mathematics and atmosphere ocean science in the Courant Institute of Mathematical Sciences of New York University and director of the Center for Atmosphere Ocean Science, also known as CHAOS. He's a director of CHAOS. Um, <laughs> his current research focuses on computer modeling of the interaction of floating ice shells with the polar ocean waters and the acquisition and application of the observational data for model improvement. Good afternoon. I want to talk to you about a subtopic of the, of the system science and in particular here looking at things we've been doing and studying relating ice sheet stability uh, and global sea level. So the setting, at least for me, starts off with how I became interested and motivated in earth science, and it has a very particular moment for me. It was the Apollo space program missions, which I found both very beautiful, and also a sense I got, and I think most people do, of the fragility of earth. And here's a little quick shot of an earth rise. 11, Houston, if that's not the earth, we're in trouble. That's the earth, and we have a very good view of it. Today, there are a few more uh, cloud bands on than uh, yesterday when we beamed down to you, but uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful sight. So, moving now to the smaller picture, talking specifically about sea level, and within that, the role of ice sheets, really what we're trying to do is quantify the risk in terms of policy decisions. Uh, let's put some numbers behind this. What do we know? Well. We know the Earth has warmed. The last century, we can look at the records and see in the polar regions in particular, significant warming. Warmer climate, one would think, would induce melting of ice. And so that's brought about uh, a lot of interest and concern over that. My particular research interest is a subcategory of all this. It's really thinking about how the ocean interacts with ice sheets. 
Why does it matter? I think that's obvious. Uh, many, most of the infrastructure around the planet, in fact, I believe now more than half the planet lives in the coastal area. And we tend to build our villages on coastlines. This is the one I live in, and it's at sea level. And one can imagine in a century or two going forward, such structures may face problems if sea level changes. So why isn't it we cannot do it? Tim showed us graphs and projections of air temperature. Why aren't there, in my opinion anyway, why aren't there credible projections of sea level? Well, it's what's going on at the coastline, for example, of Greenland. You're looking at the coastline of Greenland here, and you just saw in a 20-minute span a piece of ice crack off, a calving event, big pieces of ice, twice the height of the Empire State Building, very noisy, uh, quite impressive when you're nearby. It's the complexity of that physics that we haven't faced up to, and that's in part because this physical process is located far away from where we live. And so part of this IPY has been really pushing forward in getting us more observations, but we have uh, a long way to go and we have some commitments to make. <coughs> Basics, how do you change sea level? Well, essentially, two things to do. One is to add heat to the ocean. We've been doing that over the last century. The global ocean has warmed by one half of a degree over the last five decades. And you can add water. And the water is the question mark because you all need to understand that's the part that we have not mastered. And therefore, we do not have a comprehensive prediction. The media is ahead. This is not a, a bad thing. The media has really caught on to this point that, yeah, OK, changing the global sea level, melting ice, could be a really serious problem. Um, but the science is not quite there yet. We're getting there, but we are not there. Specific data from the past is quite good. This is, for example, the air temperature of the planet or northern hemisphere. And you can see it accelerates in the last 100 years. This is a 1,000-year record. This is the so-called hockey stick graph, which uh, brought a lot of discussion in Congress about what is a hockey stick, what does it have to do with climate. Um, I play ice hockey, and I hurt myself last week on the ice, I tell people. Um, and the hockey stick is that part of the blade there. Global sea level. This is a shorter data set, 100 years. If you walk around all our cities, you'll see little white huts in all the harbors. They've been there quite a while with tide gauges, slowly measuring away. And the trend is a change in the last century of something 20 centimeters or so. So the global ocean has changed. About half of this is from heating, and the other half, other effects. The last 10 years have seen some acceleration. But still, these are small numbers, two, three millimeters a year. And I believe Richard may speak next that in the past, um, these curves can have a slope maybe 20 times larger. And that's really the question that we're asking. Then that does represent a problem. So the nuance that I want to say to you is that the air temperature and sea level of the past, very credible. Future projections of air temperature, quite good. Uh, but I would draw the line myself on sea level. I would just leave that. OK, we're not there yet. So what are the, some of the details about how to get there and what uh, a large community of us are working on? We're working on these two ice sheets, uh, Greenland and Antarctica. And for myself, I'm going to talk for the next 10 minutes about my particular research. There's a bigger picture in this. There's lots of people working on this problem. I'm going to share particularly what I've been doing with my colleagues from around the world. So we have in Greenland the Alulasat or the Jakobshavn Ice Fjord, and in Antarctica, the Pine Island Glacier. Why pick two of these apparently random places? Well, they're not random. As cameras fly over in space, they're expensive cameras, satellites, they look down and they see a lot of change occurring in, for example, these two particular places. The physical process, being very specific now, but I do want to draw your attention to something, in this cartoon, is on one side you see the ice sheet, and by gravity, these ice sheets, which is the size of the continental US, flow into the ocean under gravity, and they break off and calve. And particularly tricky, and what we think is the mechanism for rapid change, is that warm ocean waters, essentially from the tropics, can slip underneath these ice sheets, basically undetected by satellite, and why would warm waters 
be deep and not at the surface and not detected, it's because they have lots of salt, and therefore when they get to the polar regions, they're heavy enough to be under the surface, so the only way you're going to see this happening is if you go and measure in situ right there in the ocean. And that's a hard thing. So logic would say that we should observe this, and people have been working on this for about since the last uh, IPY, the IGY. So the particular research now is uh, some SNAPS Greenland. In tracking back data for Greenland, I found uh, the first measurement I found was in the first polar year. Uh, was Hammer, and he went to Greenland, the particular fjord, Jakobshaven, and he found warm water from the Atlantic in the fjord, which he found uh, surprising. Uh, in the second IPY, uh, Belknap and others from Michigan uh, went up along the coast of Greenland, and I have a little bit of video footage from this era. This was slightly before the second IPY. This also relates to uh, Captain Peary, Admiral Peary, uh, which you'll see here in a moment, but this is from that per period of time, the late 20s. There was a great warming in the North Atlantic in that period, and there was a rapid response of Greenland to that change, although these folks didn't know that at, at the time. And Captain uh, Bar Bob Bartlett was also there. Some things don't change. These are the folks. I'm not sure what's in that drum, but uh, these uh, mosquitoes in Greenland can be quite fierce if you're out there doing field work, and so that's actually not very much different from today. Tide gauges have been set up going back to these times, uh, some of these first measurements which are archived, speaking of the value of data. Some things go wrong in expeditions, and these folks came away without their vessel. So going up to Greenland first, up here, and then we're going to launch over to the west coast to Jakobshaven. Uh, And what you should take away in thinking about Greenland and Antarctica, well, Greenland is smaller, but Greenland has much n more narrow fjords, and the ice has to come out through those fjords in order to have an impact on sea level. When we turn to Antarctica, you'll see that the, the fjords are quite large. So here we give you a sense from a NASA animation flying into Greenland on the west coast, and you see the sea ice waxing and waning, and over that, and the interior, the ice sheet. And here's this fjord, which drains about 7% of Greenland ice, which are these streamers you see coming down off the continent. So they're coming to the coastline, the calving front. What's happened in the last 150 years is there's been a gradual retreat of the ice front by a substantial amount, uh, 25 kilometers. And that retreat happens in stops and starts. A big retreat occurred in 1930 when the North Atlantic warmed, and another one occurred in 1997 also turns out when the ocean warmed. And that's what really sparked our interest here, is to think about w what happened in 1997 when that glacier accelerated. And what happened is a very short story. The winds over the ocean changed, and essentially just simply redirected an element, a, a, a fragment, a branch of the Gulf Stream towards Greenland. And what's remarkable about those kind of things is you don't need to warm the ocean to melt ice sheets. The ocean has a lot of heat, and you just need to redirect little currents towards ice sheets, and bang, you have major change. Um, I was quite impressed in doing research in Greenland that quite often people, policy folks and uh, director of NSF, etc., came to Greenland to see firsthand what was going on, and it was certainly a lot easier to explain it on site than it is sometimes in a more abstract environment. To give you a very specific example of where we need to push forward is we need to develop technologies that we presently don't have to study these areas. So this is basically the problem. I could tell you that, okay, so go measure the temperature on the, this is the coastline of Greenland. It's just a vertical ice wall a thousand meters high. You're flying over the ocean here and you're asking yourself, well, what's the ocean properties like underneath? Well, you have to find, first of all, a place to look through it. And um, what we employed were some probes that we borrowed from the Navy. And uh, this, was, this was actually a lot of fun. Uh, in a helicopter, once you find a hole in the ice, the pilot would 
hover very low. These Danish pilots are very smart. Hover very low over the ice, use the rotor wash to blow away ice, and then we would reascend to about 500 feet or 150 meters and throw these probes in, which are, I believe, used for basically submarine tracking. But they're nothing other than FM radios with thermometers attached. So if you have a good pilot, you can say to him, left, right, center, forward, and after a while, you can get this right. And sometimes you don't get it right, and it just hits the ice and waves the flag back. But that one went in, and it went down through the ocean, and we were kind of excited. It said, yeah, the deep ocean is warm and salty. So, but that was 10 years after the major event. And so, did they warm? And the answer was, yeah, and it happened in 1997. And Tim was referring to collecting data, and it really comes home true. So working with Danish and colleagues from Greenland, we went back through all the fisheries records, and we found out that the fishery folks who trawl over the seafloor of Greenland attach thermometers to all their nets, and there's an amazing data set, and it simply said Greenland was cold on the shelf up until 1997, and it warmed suddenly in 1997. And this was all recorded in very rich data sets. So the mechanics of fast change that I want to say in one slide is, if you want to think about climate change, your mind is not always the way to do it. Nature has its, has its ways, and our goal is to figure out what those ways are. And people have pointed out this mechanism before, and we were quite amazed to see it. Just change the winds a little bit, and you can move those red currents close to ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica. So change wind, change ocean, change ice sheet, change sea level is one mechanism, and it's one that can do things fast. And we, we published that last year. And we also did a computer modeling study. Antarctica is kind of data poor. So uh, at the moment, we essentially just have computer models. And again, the changes that we've seen there, we can re reproduce elements of it with computer models. And again, it points to little subtle changes in the wind turn out to be uh, a key point. You could ask, why do the winds change? Well, I'm not a meteorologist. I have asked around, and I don't think we're there yet to really understand subtle, and I do mean very subtle, changes in our atmosphere. So, a little very short trip now to Antarctica. Uh, I do want to point out Antarctica is almost 10 times the size of Greenland, and one piece of it, called the West Antarctic Ice Sheet, is essentially already in the ocean. People uh, from IGY, people figured this out. There's East Antarctica is high and dry. West Antarctica in the background is basically one mile or two kilometers below sea level. You remove the ice, the ocean advances. And that's why people have become very keen and very focused on West Antarctica for that reason, which again was discovered in IGY. Uh, I went to Antarctica with my colleague, Bob Bin Chandler, in 2008. And we went to a place called Pine Island Glacier because that's a place where things are happening. Uh, again, with the same idea, why is it changing? Why is it out of balance? And that takes you to this particular place in Antarctica called Pine Island Glacier. Again, a very beautiful place. I do want to stress a bit about the logistics. So our plan is to get ready to drill through. It's a solid ice cover, but the ocean's beneath it. And you want to go in there and you want to see what's happening. Okay, well, let's drill through, but first, uh, let's get there. So in going there, it turns out to be much more difficult by comparison to Greenland, but there are, you can get in the Air Force, you can get to Antarctica, you can get out to basically hubs, little camps, waste divide, and it's eventually into little planes, you can get pretty much anywhere with these small planes. We did run into trouble. It's a very uh, treacherous glacier, and these planes were deemed to be not acceptable. So we had to come up with another plan, and that puts us back a while in terms of making research progress. We did, while we were there, uh, do some science, and I'll share a bit of that with you in this clip. We installed a weather station, which is the weather station void area. Today we're heading off if you can see, we're leaving the waste galley where we had a very nice breakfast. And so we're heading out to the Pine Island Glacier up here. And we're going to install an automatic weather station. We hope a weather station will be installed in Antarctica. We have a, we've been here three days now, and everything's been going just great. 
you can see in the background, we've got the weather tower set up. And to the side of that, you can see the solar panels and wind turbine. It's been very uh, almost balmy here the last few days. And uh, when we've also attracted some visitors here, some skua, who are very interested in our presence. <laughs> research in such remote locations, uh, not because they're remote, but because that's where interesting science is happening and that's where we have to go to. These places are extremely difficult to get to and at the moment they're even more difficult to get back from. So in the future, uh, we eternally hold up hope and uh, the plan is to modify it and figure out how to do this and it looks like helicopters may be able to support this kind of science to get it done. I also like to point out our British and U.S. Uh, partners have, have made great progress in the last few months using new technologies, unmanned autonomous vehicles. For example, this vehicle two months ago went into the Pine Island Glacier and we're eagerly awaiting to see what data came out of that. So good things are happening, you can see. So in summary, I leave you with very simple messages. My opinion, which I stick to strongly, when and how much, that's what we want to know. It's currently not predictable. However, I really think with our international partners, we can solve this. But the part is about the doing. Uh, if we decide that we want to solve this problem, we can do that. I'd like to acknowledge all the people who have helped me in my research and in our research, the NSF, NASA, uh, the Canadian Research Council, the Greenland Institute for Natural Resources, the British Antarctic Survey, and the Danish Meteorological Institute have all been players in, in our uh, collaborators in our science. Think forward. Think Research Channel.